what does what is this all async stuff all about? It's about doing something useful with the computer while we're waiting for, let's say, a <laughs> network request or a request to the disk, or even uh, a human doing some input. So usually it's waiting for a link. And the other problem is we want to do several things at the same time. Now to solve this problem, we can use multiple processes because nowadays we have operating systems that usually let us run more processes at the same time, which is good. So you can use the set process library. I'm sure everybody did that if you've ever done something with Python. And that's fine, but uh, the processes are completely separate, so you can't access the memory of one process from the other. And it's not that nice. So people came up with threads, which are like processes, but they share memory. So one of the threads can poke into the other thread's memory, and there are some race conditions, and it's all very hairy. And the most important thing is that if you want to avoid this, you have to use locks and other synchronization primitives, which tend to be quite heavyweight. Uh, so, I don't know. I think this, let's create problems rather than solve them. Uh, Java, by the way, has pretty good support for threads and locking and all that stuff. But in Python and Ruby, we have the gil, which is like a square root. And I went, in Europe, Python, Alex Martelli went to the stage and went, the gil must die, the gil must die. And he went on for a few minutes. And... <laughs> so that's the general atmosphere about the gil. What the gil is, is the global interpreter lock, which means that uh, when Python is running, only one thread of Python can run at a time. If you do a network request or a request to the disk or something like that, uh, the gil is released for that time, and so another thread can do more processing. Uh, what the gil solves is that every Python bytecode operation is atomic, so uh, you don't have trace conditions inside the Python atomic operations. But if you want to do computation in two different threads, you pretty much can't. Unless you use PyPy or uh, some other interpreter. So another thing we have in threads are greenlets, which are like lightweight threads. They're not at the operating system level. Uh, they pretty much monkey patch the standard library so that every blocking operation like uh, the network access, will, instead of blocking, uh, start another thread, which can run. And then, when the original thread's request is processed, returns to the original thread and starts running there. It's, uh, this is called cooperative multitasking. There's supposed to be a policy. Uh, what that means is each of the threads has to explicitly give control to another thread. If, if one of the threads, or the three months, uh, just computes something and doesn't ever call up uh, the, doesn't ever yield control, uh, the other three months won't have a chance to run. And the event loop is written here because this is all managed by something called the event loop, which is like a, let's say, a list of the threads and uh, it gives control to the individual threads when, uh, when I think is it's time for them to run. We also have callbacks, which are very fun. Uh, you pretty much say, I'll now do a network request, and when that network request is done, please call this function. So uh, you do that. Uh, you yield control to another thread, with or another process. It's also run by a, an event loop, which gives control to the individual processes when they have something to do. And uh, this is very good in that it's explicit, because uh, you don't have, first of all, you don't have to monkey patch the standard library. And second of all, 
uh, you always know when you're leave, when you're yielding the control. So uh, you can't be surprised that you call some function and that function yields to another thread, and now that other thread can mutate some of your data. So it's it's not explicit, which is why there is something why people use callbacks. Uh, the downside of this is if you have a, a process that does multiple of these callbacks, like so wants to uh, do DNS resolution first, and then fetch the page, and then fetch another page, for each of these operations you have to make another function and explicitly call that function. So you have lots of little small functions and uh, it's not really clear how they operate and how they call to each other. So that's something that you see in JavaScript, for example. And uh, in Python, the twisted framework does this pretty well. It has also some other things to do with the internet. And if you like callbacks, then twisted is the thing to do. So uh, yeah, we have these three or four different methods how to do asynchronous operations. So what do we do? Uh, this is a situation similar to uh, web frameworks uh, some time ago, where you have frameworks like uh, Zoop and Quixote or something like that. Uh, I don't remember those. I wasn't programming Python at that time. But the problem was that each of those was a web server and a web framework. So uh, if you had a library for one of the frameworks, it couldn't be used in a different framework. Whereas now if you can have a, an application written in Flask, and you can use the permit debug toolbar with that, and cherry pie logging or whatever. And it's all because there is this standard called the WSGI, the Web Server Gateway Interface, that all of these web, web, framework, web frameworks speak. So your app is compatible with every framework, and every framework is compatible with every app, theoretically. Uh, now this WSGI was uh, created to be compatible with all the frameworks that existed back then, which <coughs> leaves some quirks in, in the interfaces that you usually don't have to worry about when you use the, the frameworks, but when you implement it, there are some weird things that nobody does anymore. Uh, but they have to be there to be compatible. So, one day, Guido, who's the creator of Python, sat down and said, let's do the same for async. It's probably because he was hired by Dropbox and they wanted it. <laughs> so, this new shiny thing is called async.io. It's very new and shiny. You can get it in Python 3.4, which is in beta right now. <laughs> if you're not that bleeding edge, you can install it as Tulip right now with the current version of Python that nobody uses anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like uh, the candy that should lure you to Python 3. So what AsyncIO does is explicit cooperative multitasking, just like Twisted. It uh, turns out that Twisted is a really good model and it is compatible with all the other methods that I mentioned. Uh, it said that the greenlets should, should be compatible with this async IO and uh, if you really want threads, like if you have a library based on threads or if you have a library that does blocking calls and you can't get around that, then you can upload some work to threads. So what AsyncIO does is it has a global event loop which is compatible with any other event loop. So uh, if you have a twisted application, you can run it on an adapter that can, that's compatible with the AsyncIO event loop. It has an event loop policy that decides what event loop is the global one to which all the other should connect to. And you can use any event loop that is compatible with the interface. But usually it's the default one for async IO. Uh, because it's based so much on twisted, it's based on callbacks. So we have 
uh, these two methods on the event loop. One is called soon, and the other is called later. Uh, the thing about these callbacks is that every time, uh, only uh, at each point of time, only one callback is ever executed, so they're serialized. If uh, you want to do something between callbacks, you have to do another callback. You can have two executing at the same time, or two overlapping, or, or something. Uh, the ones that you schedule with call soon will be executed in the order you schedule them. And uh, call later will call it after roughly some time that you specify. Uh, time is defined as units close to seconds with a zero somewhere. <laughs> so here's a little program. I hope the Python guys here understand pretty much what's going on. You have a loop, so you get the global event loop. You call a function soon, uh, give it the loop as the parameter. The function does something fancy and then uh, calls the same function two seconds later. And then you run forever, and it prints hello world every two seconds. Is that clear? Uh, one question. Uh, does that uh, like deal with the problem that you can't utilize multiple cores with Python at the same time? Or no. No. Right. It's still it's still blocked by guilt. It still has guilt. Uh, nothing changes in the core Python. This is all built on whatever was there since generators were introduced. So. Yeah. If you want to use more cores, then you have to do more processes, mm -hmm. which people say is the best method to do that. Mm -hmm. Or you can use threads with all the <laughs> problems with that come with threads. Uh, another thing Async IO has is futures. Those were before Async IO in some form. Does anybody know what futures are? So futures are like placeholder objects for a result that will be computed later. So uh, you can get the result with the result method, and if the future already has a result, then this returns it. Otherwise, it freezes itself. You can set a result, which means that from now on, the result <laughs> method will return this value. You can set an exception, which means that the result method will raise this exception. And uh, you can add a callback to the future, which means that when somebody calls set result of exception, the callback will be executed. So this is pretty much all you need to uh, convert or to use callbacks to uh, convert your uh, normal code to, let's say, to asynchronous code. Uh, Futures were here before as concurrent.futures, which uh, I think also appeared in Python 3. But uh, so now we have two futures modules that have roughly the same interface, which is because uh, they didn't want to change the futures module as it was. They built an async, the async IO as, as a kind of a separate thing. And uh, the future plan is to merge these two together, so they will have exactly the same API. And they plan it to plan to do it by checking in Futures if a global uh, event loop is running, and if it is, then it will uh, behave like this future. Uh, there are also locks, semaphores, and queues. If you don't know what these are, then sorry, I'll explain them. <laughs> But uh, we also have lock semaphores and queues in the threads module, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it kind of looks like another standard. Which is good. Uh, now the thing people talk most about in ACIO, it's really just a tiny thing that you don't have to use, but people <laughs> tend to get hyped up about this, is coroutines. Now. Uh, how many of you know what this yield from is? Three. 
Okay, well, I'm also sorry, maybe I'll do a lightning talk on Yield from. But, uh, you know what Yield does? I hope so. <laughs> so, uh, Yield from pretty much uh, gets a generator or something like that and uh, yields the things from the generator to, uh, you know, outside of, of, uh, of the current function and then it uh, returns the result of that error. If you didn't get that, then maybe I'll do the like result. But uh, an async IO, the uh, async IO coroutines, the yield from is uh, pretty much saying, I want to run this function, uh, and the function may uh, suspend the execution. It may yield control to, to another thing. So it's, you don't have to know what it's, how it's implemented inside. But so, so what it does is it gets an event loop and it runs until this is complete. So this has a while to loop, so it runs forever. And uh, this async I got sleep is a coroutine which uh, pretty much blocks the thread or, or sleeps for one second and then you have to control back here. So this again will every two seconds alternate between these two readings. Good yes. question. Uh, can I not report back around a while of this is sleeping? Yes. Okay. This this is an ACIO coroutine, core routine, so, so it's not blocking sleep. It's it's not a blocking sleep. Nothing. Nothing of this is blocking. Yes. Any other questions? Is this clear? So or should I attempt to explain some more. Now, so, so this pretty much means that you can write code uh, in a normal way, in a procedure way, and just uh, write the yield from where it will block. Whereas uh, if you wrote the callback style, then you would have to define another function from this and call it from here as a callback, and then call back here as another callback. So people think this is much clearer and I uh, Another thing async IO does is transports and protocols. Transports are objects that deal with connections like TCP, SSL, or communi take communicating with a subprocess, stuff like that. And protocols are things built on, on top of that. So you have an object that, for example, you say to it, fetch me a web page, and it communicates with, let's say, TCP or SSL over TCP and gives you the web page. So, uh, most people write protocols and transports are usually provided by async IO or some specialized library. Uh, last thing I have is some non-trivial code, which is taken from the example in the documentation. So, this is a protocol. It has a connection made method, data received, and connection lost. It just does print on those, except connection lots, to also stop the event loop. And there's a create connection method uh, on the event loop that creates uh, a TCP protocol and uh, registers this. Uh, uh, or a TCP transport and registers this protocol with it so it all works nicely and then you run until complete and with the... Do you need any more time? Did I lose you all? <laughs> <laughs> and the best thing, the best way to learn it is to play with it so yes, uh, it's a bad style to <laughs> code on the screen, but here it is. This is a server protocol. It again has connection made and data received, but the connection with made will be called every time some client makes the makes the connection. Instead of create connection, you create a server, and uh, yeah, there's keyboard interrupt so that you can kill it with Control C. Is the porting server or? It does polling on the hmm? Is that forking server or? Uh, no, no forking here. Oh, 
fork means create a sub process. Yes. This is so all this is inside of the process. Right? This is async. async. So it's right? probably pulling. Um, yes, under the hood it's pulling. Yeah. Thanks. Now, if if it has nothing to do, then it pulls until the next event. Yeah. Right. Any questions? Was this useful to anybody? <laughs> Good to do uh, have you used <laughs> Chrome Boss? <laughs> have you used it for something? I've played around with it. <laughs> you wrote the code. <laughs> yes. Wasn't this something? <laughs> <laughs> could you could, could you go back to one slide? And I'm not sure what uh, the core uh, variable contains. It's, it's uh, I'm not the Pythonist, so. Uh, the transport protocol. Maybe the, 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 uh, that the coro is the coro is a coroutine. The create server method will return the coroutine, which you know, so it, contains it's, the, it's the Python generator and so, some yes. yeah. So it gives you, let's say, a task or a process, then that you then have to schedule. So it's run until complete, and that uh, does a bit of handshake. Okay. Or handshake. Well, set up. It sets up the, the server. And because uh, there's no yield from here, so the uh, the create server method has to return immediately. And uh, establishing a server. Can take some time. It can block, so that's why it's done. That it is coded. So the run until complete actually runs the coroutine until it starts the server. On the yeah. second line, the server is started, right? Yeah, here the server is started, and then you run forever to handle the. Perfect, you break. <laughs>